Hello everyone and welcome to the pre-concert talk for Queen Mary's Black History Month recording of the Five Fantasies for String Quartet by Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Coleridge Taylor was a violinist and singer uh, who studied at the Royal College of Music uh, and was mostly active in the 19th and 20th centuries as a, a prolific composer uh, and has unfortunately recently fallen out of popularity. So in an effort to improve representation and also to highlight some really fantastic movement um, music, our string quartet has recorded uh, this piece. Um, Josh, what was it like preparing this piece? Uh, well, first of all, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was really, really, really great piece to play. And there's a basically a little bit for every everyone in in the in each movement. Um, it was, I mean, there were obviously a few. Uh, it's quite obviously quite a challenging piece for everyone. I think we can get into it a little bit later, but there's quite a few. Um, it's quite virtuosic and very multi-layered, and that uh, added a little bit to the difficulty. But ultimately, um, all of us have been uh, locked up for like five or six months not being able to play together and then just the opportunity to do that again was brilliant and even better for it being such a brilliant piece. Ramesh, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Uh, yes, so just like Josh was saying, there are definitely a lot of interesting musical challenges throughout the piece and it makes it challenging but it's also just so engaging and so exciting to learn. So techniques like three against two time, harmonics, there was a lot of polyphony by using double stopping and triple stopping. They're all difficult and complex methods, but they make it so much more interesting to get through. And College Taylor has this amazing way of manipulating the key theme um, and weaving it throughout the different movements just to make it shine in different ways. So it was challenging sometimes to know when the player should pronounce that or when they should hold back or when they should integrate it in a different way, as well as just injecting our own musicality into these thematic developments. But I think as a collective, we made some good decisions and it was definitely, it was so fun to play. Nushka, how would you describe Coleridge Taylor's style? Um, I would say it's full of life. There's lots of fun in it, lots of rhythms, great melodies, it's tonal, which not gonna lie is a relief. Um, and I think my favourite thing about it is how the themes are developed. So you'll be playing a melody in the first movement and throughout the whole piece, you'll just find it in different shapes and forms and topologies and conformations, different parts. And you can literally kind of follow your music while listening to everyone else's parts and follow the propagation of each idea. Um, so it gives the idea that even though each of the fantasies as five of them are completely different in their mood and style, they're somehow deeply interconnected by the melodies in them. Um, so it makes it a fantastic piece to play after a lockdown of being in different like zones of the country because you're just so connected to the other players by what you're playing. So it's a brilliant piece and I would 100% recommend giving it a listen. Uh, in addition to our fantastic string quartet, we're also lucky enough to have Georgie with us. Um, Georgie, as a Black composer, what's your experience of the classical music world been like? Well, as a Black composer, it's a very interesting and vast place to be. But I do feel, however, it's uh, somewhat underrepresented. But at the same time, music is a universal language. So some, uh, some leeway, some headway needs to be made in terms of breaking down barriers and uh, introducing more black people and ethnic minorities into classical music and uh, interests alike. Wonderful. Do you have any thoughts about the way that Coleridge Taylor and his music are treated at the moment? Personally, uh, my, my personal thoughts on Coleridge Taylor are, I understand that, uh, about having difficulties and having obstacles that would uh, set many people back, but at the same time making the, the best out of the situation and having supportive people around you who value you and your art and to be given rare and exciting opportunities to explore and develop yourself and your skill set to really be taken in under someone's wing and uh, um, nurtured and by spiritual advocates. I'm going to open up some questions to anyone. So if you have any comments, please feel free to add them. 
Um, what do we think about the presence of minority composers in our curriculum, in our schools and universities, and even informal ways of learning music? Uh, so I feel quite strongly about this. So as a Northern Irish student during A-level music, there was a very distinct westernization of the syllabus, both uh, historically and with contemporary music, where a subject like music, which represents, like Georgie was saying, an international language, you would hope to cover an international set of topics. And I only personally had one encounter with one set work, Old Man River, that had the narrative of a minority group. Yet, in that way, it comes across as very tokenistic as opposed to an appreciation and an academic understanding of the history behind the composition. So not only just for visibility, but also to give everyone an appreciation of music in its holistic state. I think it is so important to include more minority composers within the curriculum to gain that appreciation of music as a whole and to understand music and its complexities from all the different perspectives it comes from. Anushka, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, I do actually. One of the things I was going to say, which has become a bit of an issue with the current government, is the importance and the value of art and one of the ways that I think we should be propagating the kind of inclusion of diverse you know diverse range of people in the arts is by introducing more arts education in schools because I think that if we introduce arts education in state schools it's going to predispose us to an environment where there is more diversity in the arts um, and one thing that I found from studying music from historical perspectives is that often some of the greatest music is about some of the hardest times in people's lives um, especially in the last century so I think that the arts can be used by people as a way of coping with difficulties and expressing themselves and I think that in this current climate of Covid that's so important and even just just generally um, so I hope that's going to be something that we'll see more you know, 100 years down the line, we'll have a diverse range of people involved in the arts because we've educated our population in the arts. I might have a few things. Uh, so I think there's, at, at least at the moment, there's a sort of attitude of elitism present in, and it has been for a while, present in classical music particularly, which has sort of led to the idea of these, the, the traditional idea of it being an ex, sort of exclusively white European um, domain, especially for composers. And I think that's resulted in quite a lot of um, works by uh, um, people of uh, ethnic minorities to be a little bit overlooked. And uh, it also, also that attitude leads to a sort of discouraging, a discouragement of people from getting involved and taking an interest, which in turn exacerbates the problem. And I think, I mean, I de I'm, it's definitely a good thing that there we're reaching an, an era in which there's more cultural awareness of we're, we're exploring some of these works that previously wouldn't be particularly um, well known. And I think that's definitely a positive change we're seeing. If I could just jump really quickly off what Josh said, I completely agree with that sense of elitism and almost a sense of gentrification in music education. Again, coming from Northern Ireland in my youth orchestra, I was one of two people who were minority groups. And that does reflect the demographic of Northern Ireland, but also the inaccessibility of groups like that in a whole. So that idea of homogenizing and making music education so much more accessible is so important because I'm not studying music, no one here is studying music, yet the skills and the friendships and the opportunities that we develop along the way have gotten me to this point. And it is just about getting that appreciation. So why not, as music is such an international language, why not have these opportunities and accesses be international also? That's such a good point. I think this is one of the things that people I think it's just the assumption of a lot of people, oh, the arts are useless, oh, it doesn't make any money, I can't make, get any jobs. But I would pretty much say that every single skill that I'd say I have, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, basically comes from having learned music. Because there's so much you learn that's so relevant to everything, whether that's just discipline, which 
you use for sport or work or it's the ability to understand something in a different language or learn about something from someone else's perspective or performance skills um which is important or speaking skills or just physical accuracy so i mean for me i'm a medical student if anyone was operating on me i prefer it would be a musician who could play in tune just because you need you know fine motor skills um so i just i just really think that it's important to give those skills to people in every single walk of education um you know you could almost be in a situation where you only learn music and you'd be in a better position to get a job at the end because you know you'd have all the sufficient skills that you need to retrain in anything you like including cyber you know um <laughs> uh, how have your views of black composers changed during this musical journey um so it's difficult because I don't know if I would be able to say that it's changed because before this musical journey, I had not been introduced to black composers at all. This is my first encounter with a black composer and it's down to the fact that it is just not presented to us either in the curriculum or through my involvements in orchestras. We just simply aren't shown them. So I've been so grateful to have this opportunity to see that black composers are so incredibly, just like every composer, they're a composer for a reason. We're highlighting black composers and at the same time we are highlighting the similarity between all composers. They are all amazing in their own individual ways and they have different musical ideas and perspectives. And I've just been so grateful to see a new perspective and it's definitely encouraged me to look more into underrepresented composers to find these gems that have just been hidden for so long. I think it's sort of eye-opening to I, what I what I thought is while playing the piece is I had the, the thought of well how how much how much how many other works have we been sort of I guess deprived of or not not exposed to as a result of underrepresentation and backwards cultural attitudes that have existed in the past and continue to exist to this day. Um, it's just there's probably a countless just loads of such high quality works that people just haven't heard and that aren't widely performed or aren't widely listened to i think that's quite um quite upsetting way yeah no one thing i think about that question is a bit of a weird question because my my opinion of black composers hasn't really changed as a result of one person because when Coleridge Taylor wrote the quartet, you know, was he representing black composers or was he just writing a string quartet? And I think in a way, I mean, I don't know whether I'd say it's a shame or whether it's just something I've noticed that if you're writing from a minority group, the, the consensus is that you're a representative of that group. It's like, you know, my, my opinion of classical music shouldn't be altered by hearing a piece of Mozart. He's not a representation of Beethoven and Purcell and Bach. Um, so I think, you know, you treat each person as a person in their own right, regardless of who they are. Um, which I think means that it's additionally important for us to go searching for different works. Because not, not necessarily because of, you know, the ethnic background of who wrote them, but, but just because they're great in their own right. And we're so lucky to have played this piece. Um, you know, whoever Coleridge Taylor was, like, he could have been a Martian. It's still a great piece. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And Coleridge Taylor, when I was doing some reading about him, he was described as the Black Mahler. And in my head, I was just like, why does he have to be the Black Mahler? He can just be Coleridge Taylor. He has his own style, he has his own motifs, he has his own techniques, so why does he have to be referenced to a white composer? It doesn't matter. Like, you can just say he has a similar style. No, Let that be. Yeah, also, I didn't see it at all. So <laughs> he has something that is completely distinct to Mahler and distinct to other composers. So appreciate him for his abilities. Oh, excellent. I think that draws our conversation to a close. We've had some really interesting discussions about the current effect of um, our curriculum on music education and how that affects how we see um, minority composers and our own perceptions of how 
um, a single composer could be taken to represent a minority when really they are a composer in their own right and we should value them for their music, which is definitely uh, an experience we've all learned from um, while sort of learning about and informing ourselves on, on Carl Ridge Taylor's works. Um, so thank you ev everyone very much for coming and we look forward to seeing you when we finally have in-person concerts um, in the future. Thank you.